Yeah. My, my, name's, my name is John Fountain. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. We, um, we record these things and put them up on our, on our little, as a little webcast for the students okay. and staff to look. Is that okay with you? Of course. Cool. Okay, if you could, I think we, we actually hope this is working. There's about a 25% chance it's not, but three quarter chance that it is. <laughs> if you if you clip it on your lapel somewhere and then stick this in your pocket, that would be good. Is that okay? Yeah, it's probably easier in your pocket. Than yeah, yeah, yeah. You can put it on a belt or you can get it there, but it'll, it'll work inside your pocket. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How do you check? Yeah, thank you very much, Marsh and Andrea, for uh, inviting me and having me here. It's great, really. It's my second visit to, uh, to New Zealand, my first one to Christchurch, and I'm having a good time here. So, um, uh, and by the way, if you have a question, please interrupt immediately. Take a question as we go along. I prefer that. So <coughs> what I'm talking about is uh, an issue that interests me a lot uh, currently, uh, and that's um, to understand the behavioral consequences of performance incentives. And um, another issue of mine, uh, uh, research is, uh, interest of mine, is <coughs> understanding voluntary cooperation. Voluntary cooperation meaning people do something even if it's not in their self-interest, if they, they help and cooperate with others, even if this is not necessary in their self-interest. So what if people do something voluntarily, voluntary cooperation? How does that square with incentives which give you an individual selfish incentive to perform? So we are interested in understanding how performance incentives affect voluntary cooperation. <coughs> so that is what this talk will be about, and here is a little bit more specific motivation. The basic motivation uh, for all, this, all of these research is that uh, employment mm -hmm. uh, contracts are typically what's called an incomplete contract. That means not everything that's relevant for the employment relationship is written into the contra contract in, in an enforceable way. So um, many scholars, uh, including Oliver Williamson, who got the Nobel Prize this year, uh, last year, um, recognized that this is an important thing. So. Um, so in the, in the literature, this goes under what I call voluntary cooperation. It goes under the heading of work, morale, creativity, loyalty, initiative, goodwill. And I will use voluntary cooperation as a sort of summary term. And influential scholars, as I said, have written about this. Here is a quote by Truman Bewley, who is an economist who interviewed many 300 personnel managers uh, about what's important in employment relationships. And he was saying that um, that basically this is the expression of what voluntary, voluntary cooperation is the necessary thing because there are so many ways to, uh, opportunities to take advantage of employers that it's not wise to depend on coercion or financial incentives alone as motivators. You need to rely on voluntary cooperation as the same. So <coughs> a lot of uh, research in this field uh, has actually studied that. What does it, what is voluntary cooperation? And how do we control for people's you know, selfish interests, basically, self-regarding interests? And that was the previous research. I think, I, I hope to convince you after a few slides from here, that if you're not already convinced that previous research has focused on the existence of voluntary cooperation, we can take it for granted that it exists. Even if we control for all possible selfish incentives to cooperate. So. Um, given this, there's another observation that, uh, uh, that uh, performance incentives are quite popular and um, therefore what I'm interested in here is if people cooperate voluntarily uh, and now you, give, now you have performance incentives which appeal to their individual self-interest, how do these things fit together at all? And this is interesting and important because voluntary cooperation is always going to be important according to, to this observation. You cannot never, in no, no real meaningful employment relationship, regulate everything in, 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 by, by, an, by an enforceable contract. Therefore, there's always room for voluntary cooperation. That's the issue. But if that's the case, we need to rely on voluntary cooperation to ensure efficient employment relationships. So the question is, what about if, if we have performance incentives? How do they affect people's behavior? Yeah. Yes, please. Cooperate, but just to uh, drop off a little bit, 
Nie. Tu. Yeah. Okay. So what I mean is to 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 perform effi eff efficiently and probably in the best interest of the employer, you need some sort of non-opportunistic behavior. Yes. That is um, that is what is. M I mean, it will become very clear in just the next slide. I hope. So what I'm interested in is is not uh, is uh, related to a literature in psychology about the crowding out of intrinsic motivation. So the argument there is in this literature is that people sometimes, if when one uses incentives for paying people for tasks they like, their intrinsic motivation is kind of destroyed or cr what's called crowded out. So it's substituted. They, they do it only for the money. Yeah. So um, and that's uh, I mean it's a little bit of a debated literature, but uh, the psychologists in the room know this probably better than I has. Uh, um, been in discussed in economics by Bruno Frey and many people related to him quite a bit. Another uh, related literature is what's, I it's what's called the hidden costs of incentives. So they produce unwanted side effects, and partly also due to what's called social preferences. So things like exist, like voluntary corporations do exist. So, <coughs> so this is the basic motivation. Let me jump into a model experimental model that will be our workhorse and in which we study what we mean by voluntary cooperation where we will introduce incentives also. So this is a model that I have adapted from the first game of this sort by Fair Kirschweiger and Riedl in Quarterly Journal of Economics. And this is a model that was inspired by George Akerlof's uh, theory of the employment relationship. And this theory argues that in the real world employment relationships are are regulated by quid pro quos. So I work, if you pay me a decent wage, I work hard. Uh, if, or I, if, if I get good working conditions, I respond by decent effort. Yeah, and that day um, is, um, and when he developed, when Akelov developed that model, he relied on case studies he had access to from social psychology. There was no systematic uh, evidence showing this. So the, the, the goal of that paper was to divide, provide an experimental model where this theory can be tested and holding constant basically any other self-regarding motivation that people might have to, which obviously in these case studies you cannot rule out. So that is the motivation for this and here is the model. So in these experiments or in this, in this model participants are they are randomly allocated to two roles, so employer and employee or worker. And um, we have this structure of the employment relationship. So it's very simple. The employer chooses a wage, which in our experiment is a number between 0 and 700. And the worker sees that wage and uh, accepts or rejects this wage offer. It's a fixed wage, non-contingent on any effort. And then he or she chooses a costly effort. Effort here is uh, symbolized by numbers with the interpretation of effort levels. They are costly to the uh, to the agent, to the worker. Higher effort, higher costs. And then after this, the uh, payoffs are realized. And um, this is the simplest version of what's of, of an incomplete contractual relationship because effort is not specified. Yeah, so there's only a fixed wage here, and um, there is no obligation to perform any effort because the agent is a, uh, able to choose any effort he or she likes. These are the payoffs for the worker. So the worker receives the fixed wage and has to bear the costs of effort. The costs of effort are increasing in effort, that's the usual assumption. And the employer receives the revenues which, is the, which are increasing in effort and has to pay uh, the fixed wage. So it's you can think of this at that stage as like a textbook example of an employment relationship. Higher effort, higher return, but also higher effort costs, which means the, ins the interests between employers and employees are, op are, are at opposite. So um, you know, the, the employer obviously wants to have a high effort because this gives him a high return and wants to pay a low wage. Uh, and for the workers the other way around, he wants to have a high wage and slack off because effort is increasingly costly. It's just, it's just a single worker here. 
yeah, in this model, yes, yes. There are no differentiation homogeneous, homogeneous good. So the way these experiments are then run, is suppose this is a one-shot situation here. Yeah. So we, we have exactly, the, the, since effort is increasingly costly, the incentive is to, to slack off completely and to choose the lowest effort level of one in this case. And uh, this is obviously, uh, the, the, the way this is typically modeled is obviously inefficient because the best, you know, the highest, largest revenue would be created with an effort of 20. And um, therefore the efficient execution, the fully most efficient execution of the contract would be uh, to work maximally. Yeah. So that's the, the, this conflict of interest and what makes voluntary cooperation. That's what, if you deviate from this incentive uh, of choosing the lowest effort level, that's voluntary cooperation in this setting. So another important prediction here is that um, actual effort level is independent of the wage. Yeah? So an agent here will always choose the minimum effort irrespective of the, of, of the wage he or she has received. The gift exchange theory would say no, higher, efforts are higher wages are reciprocated by higher efforts. Low wage, low effort. So we should observe a positive correlation. Yeah? The standard payoff maximizing solution uh, would say effort should be independent of wage. In this case, not. Uh, in, uh, in our later experiments, yes. Okay. But this is just uh, to set the stage. This is the framework that has been used. This framework has been used in many experiments in variations. Uh, but that's not important at that stage. I will show you just a couple of slides from here. I'll show you some results from experiments in this Maybe regard. Maybe this will come later. So the worker um, um, option is not completely the same as another uh, employer. Yeah. In some experiments, so Okay, let me, let me show you some results and then I show you a little bit more. So as I said, this framework is only a sketch. Obviously, there are many experiments in this which have changed lots of dimensions. But the important point for me is not this, is this point. What I want to show is what is a typical result. Here is actually the result from our own experiments. Uh, we'll explain later where we did this game for 30 periods. I show you this in blocks of 10 periods. Here, and this is a scatter plot where on the x-axis we have the fixed wage and on the y-axis we have the actual effort. And the prediction, remember, from this maximization argument is um, effort should be independent of wage. This is true for, the, the, every dot here is an observation. So these are all data in this treatment, in this experiment. You see indeed that this is a clustering of uh, minimum effort irrespective of the wage. This is true in all uh, phases here. But then we also have this part here. You know, these are people who react to higher wages, higher effort. And on average, that's the, the positive wage effort relationship. Yes? <coughs> if you choose from a way I'm eyeballing of a few distributions, it looks like the distribution on the right is probably shifting uh, density to the, to the left corner. Uh, not, there's nothing significant here. So this means um, this relationship is pretty stable. This means, for my, for my purpose here, um, and this is not a new result at all. Yeah. This just sets this the, 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 the benchmark from our own study. We have replicated in our parameter set. We have replicated previous findings. Actually, here is the data from the first experiment. If they use different parameters, but um, same idea, wage effort predicted minimum actually observed positive. Can you just go back to slides again? Mm -hmm. If you look at the right hand graph and you also look at the this one? 150 and that's the graph that you have on the slide, if you went over the mean, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be that distribution. I would mm -hmm. say I would say it's across the graph, so I would say that that corner would have been the mean. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it, it, what happens is that the fixed wage maybe went down a little bit, so we observe more here. 
But what is important for me uh, is that the relationship between effort and wages is not changed. This is a regression line here, a non-parametric regression line, so this looks uh, stable. And our econometrics also shows this. So, but as I said, this is not new. Here is a whole bunch of papers that use this framework, which all find this relationship. Uh, and I would say this is the conclusion from this. There is reciprocity-based voluntary cooperation. Higher, e higher wages, higher effort. So here is just to, 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 to give you some samples what people have looked at to take check for the, the robustness of these findings. What if stakes are high, you know, more than normal in an experiment? Here they used experiments in this study here of experiments conducted in Russia. And uh, the high stakes experiment was up to three months salary was at stake. And these are normal stakes here are just what you typically earn in an experiment. And you see there is no relation, there's, there's no difference, but an increasing uh, positive relationship between wage and effort. So the stakes itself, what is at stake, doesn't differ that much. Yeah. People have studied non-students, what about, do these results also hold for normal people outside the university undergraduate population? The answer is yes, actually even more so. Um, people who, um, for example, in this study uh, here, these were soldiers, sampled from uh, all walks of life. These are MBAs and these are undergraduates. Actually, the undergraduates are the least uh, reciprocators here. Yeah. Social distance, so what, if, what does anonymity, does that matter? Does it matter that we play the game repeatedly? Uh, whatever, not going into the details of all this, what you see is higher wages, higher effort. Then, okay, these laboratory experiments are artifactual, you know, strange, because if people choose a number in a payoff table, how realistic is that? Do we get reciprocity in more meaningful tasks? People run, and here is a study by Gnesi, run real effort. So you have to do something for the task, not just picking a number. Same idea. So this is just to reinforce the point I was saying we have observed across a large range. You know, this is just a selection of things. We have observed that this voluntary cooperation exists for whatever reason. So this brings me to my research question. The, uh, I'm interested in understanding the interplay between explicit incentives and uh, this voluntary cooperation. So <coughs> And uh, I borrow a little bit the terminology and, uh, from um, this, this the psychological literature that I mentioned on the crowding out of intrinsic motivation. I borrow that um, uh, here. And the question here is, is there a crowding out uh, of voluntary cooperation? And I will distinguish between two, short, two sorts of crowding out, of what I call the short run crowding out, by which I mean in the contemporaneous presence of incentives and the possibility for voluntary cooperation. How is voluntary cooperation effective when there are incentives present? Yeah. So that's what I call short run, or I could also call it contemporaneous crowding out effect, if there is any crowding effect. Yeah. Second question is, is there a long run crowding effect? What, if, what also this, this, this literature in psychology suggests, once you have started to pay, yeah, then you can't simply revert to the prepay situation if there was such a thing. You know, there will be, people will only do it for, because they have been paid. So if you want, if you, the classic example is if you start paying your child for mowing the lawn, you would only do it for the money even though the child might have been willing to do it without money beforehand. Yeah, so that's the idea here too. Can we abolish incentives and what sort of voluntary cooperation do we get here? The third question I'm asking in this is there, is there a framing effect? Now by a framing effect I mean are there behavioral differences the way we de describe and explain these incentives? So we will, have, we will compare a bonus treatment, a bonus incentive with a fine incentive. And we will design this experiment in a way that is theoretically, objectively equivalent. Yeah, and then we have the obviously arguments uh, from decision theory that there shouldn't be any difference because objectively the similar situation should lead to, sa to the same behavior. Yeah. So, and uh, a practical reason why we have this design is that the university where I worked 
before I moved to Nottingham, developed, uh, they wanted to introduce some incentives and developed a list of guidelines. And the first bullet point on that list of guidelines was always frame things positively. I thought, well, that's interesting that they say this and point out as point number one, because uh, you know, we have this argument that it shouldn't matter. So maybe there is something that these people know that we don't know. So maybe it's worth studying and see whether in this context bonus has different sort of effects than fine. Um, I will then study explicitly the role of experience uh, uh, within uh, with trust contracts. So there are no incentives. What, what if people are used to a trust environment and we now introduce incentives? Yeah, what sort of effects do we get here? And the last part, if I have time, is implicit incentives, by which I mean if people just, you know, in, in, in many real world employment relationships, these are long term employment relationships. So people might have an incentive to cooperate for strategic reasons. You know, and we study them, we study these effects as well. So the goal is to investigate these effects yeah, uh, all in one comprehensive design. So you can compare the different effects if you want and, and answer these questions systematically. you're asking about the idea of incest, um, would you discriminate between, like again in those three boxes that you had, mm -hmm. it seems clear that there's that you know, wage and effort relationship, mm -hmm. but there's also clearly a bunch of people who are mm -hmm. in there about and, the, and I'm wondering if would you, in your effect, can you, would you sort of separate, can you separate those two elements of them, discriminate between those, those two types that seem to be there? Yes, that's a very good point uh, that uh, I will not address much today. Uh, but this is what we are currently working on, is to, to fix the econometrics for that. And um, that is an important issue. Yeah. But this is just, first, this is what we want to do. Okay. Any questions on this? If not, then I go and explain why we believe that there might be interaction effects in the first place. Why do we have the idea that it might matter? The basic argument is that uh, voluntary cooperation and performance incentives tap into different psychological mechanisms. Here is the psychology of voluntary cooperation. Yeah, the psychology of voluntary cooperation is, for example, equity concerns. Yeah, um, this was pointed out a long time ago by a psychologist, uh, George Adams. And uh, it's the idea, you know, if I have been treated nicely, I want to restore this the, the, the inequity that was created by that by working hard and therefore restoring, inequi uh, uh, restoring equity. There are newer versions here, for example, of theory of inequity inversion that would predict that for purely equity motives. That's one possibility. Another possibility is reciprocity. I have received a nice wage. That's a kind act because he could have offered me a low wage. He, no, he gave me a high wage. And I, I respect that and want to respond in kind. Yeah, that's a motivation. Guilt aversion is a motivation. So say, okay, if this guy pays me a high wage, you know, probably expects a high effort, and I would feel guilty, would I let him down by, by shirking, or slacking? Yeah. So people want to avoid that, can produce these effects. Or social esteem, I want to be held in good esteem by my employer, and therefore I choose high effort. Now the point of this is not that I'm not going to distinguish between these source of motivations. This is just to say these are maybe these are some motivations that people have studied and formalized. These are all based on formalized theories of motivations that can explain this positive relationship between wage and effort. So for, for me, the, 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 the importance is not the source of that, whether it's this or that. The important point here is this point all in the same direction, which suggests there are several different psychological mechanisms pointing in the same direction, which says it should be a, a robust phenomenon. Yeah, that's what I think here. And, um, but the psychology of performance incentives, I would argue, uh, is, uh, is a bit different. Because performance incentives, um, in particular uh, explicit performance incentives, by which I mean it the contract says exactly if you do this, then you will get that reward. If you do that, you will get that reward. Yeah, they give you a selfish reason uh, uh, to, to perform. So I look at the contract and say, well, yes, it's in my self-interest to do what this contract says or not. 
So I consider that sort of uh, reasoning. Yeah, they are arguments that uh, performance incentives transform the nature of the, uh, the relationship. You know, if I do things on a quid pro quo basis, that's another you know, open-ended kind of friendship. Okay, you help me, I help you, you help, I help you. So this sort of gift exchange is not, uh, is not the same thing as a price-based uh, exchange relationship, like I go up and buy cookies at a given price. You know? So, and um, the use of incentives might also signal distrust. Ah, you offer me an incentive contract, apparently you think I'm a lazy bastard. Maybe I'm a lazy bastard now. So, so this sort of thing, did, did, I don't know what the psychologists think about this, but uh, from my reading of the literature, this is a different thing here. Yeah, so this is why we believe there might be uh, interaction effects. And how do we study them? Yes, please. This reminds me of a study which might be somewhat related about daycare. Mm -hmm. So when, when certain churches in their kids play and yes. um, the government has charged for them, but then they don't pay the fee, eventually they uh, put their kids longer into daycare because they yes. are so important. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. That is one of the field experiments uh, that uh, feeds to that, yes. Any other question? So this is exactly here in this study. I, I'm working on that issue too, but not in this. Yeah, in this I want to get uh, rid of that dimension because it is already, you know, I want to isolate one aspect in a in a framework where we have been able to reproduce this positive relationship between wage and effort many times. Thinking the other and thinking about the interaction effects. One would think that there's probably a little bit more of a stress is, is the money tax to the following money. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can think of this. Yes, you can think of this that way. If you say voluntary cooperation is a source that I want to tap into, yeah, but I can't motivate, uh, incentivize it directly. I can incentivize the selfish part of things, and that's another Yeah, it's another way of explaining it. Here, I was just saying, okay, voluntary cooperation operates on different psychological mechanisms than performance incentives. The question is, how do they square? How do they fit? Yeah. So here is how we study this. And um, what I'm going to explain is the so-called stage games. And the stage games will be repeated. So the stage game is this, the, the, the game that people play in every given round, this repeated experiment. And I will run three, look at three different stage games. One I call the trust game, where there will be no incentives. Call a fine game where the incentive comes in the form of an announced wage reduction. And then we look at the bonus game where the incentive comes in the form of an announced bonus payment. So here are the uh, actual parameters. So a contract consists now of three elements, yeah, or, yeah, uh, or two. So the announced wa uh, wage, a desired effort, now the principal can. Um, um, say, okay, I, I would like to have a particular effort level. So he would say, I pay you a wage of 200, and I would like to have an effort level of 12. But the contract is incomplete, which means the agent does what he or she wants to do. Yeah. So these are the payoffs, again, as before, wage minus cost of effort. And this is now the parameters of the, of the return here, 35 times effort minus the wage. Effort cost for simplicity is just linear here. Higher effort, higher effort cost, effort cost are zero at the uh, lowest effort level of one. Now if the contract is rejected, both get nothing in every stage game. So that's the trust game. So the fine game and the bonus game are exactly the same, except that the contract that the principal offers now includes an announced wage reduction or fine. Yeah? So uh, and this could take these four levels here. So the announced wage reduction could be zero, 24, 52, or 80. It would say the contract, for example, would now say, 
I pay you a wage of 200, I would like to have an effort level of 12 at least. And uh, if your effort, the actual effort falls short of 12, I reduce your wage by 80, let's say. Okay? This leads to these payoffs. If the desired effort exceeds, the actual effort exceeds the desired effort, you receive the announced fixed wage, otherwise your effort, your, your fixed wage is reduced by this fixed amount here. Yeah? And obviously the other way around. So the bonus game is now the same. And the bonus game is, one second, the bonus game is now you receive uh, a bonus if your actual effort is at least as large as the desired effort. Yeah, then you receive a bonus, otherwise you just don't receive the bonus. Steve? So just, just to clarify again, um, if the foreign foreign happens, it's probably one thing. Yes. So no prob no 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 there's no we didn't complicate the story here by adding probabilistic moves or detectability issues. Yeah. You know we, because I'm not, not saying that's realistic and everything. The point here is that's not to the it's not necessary for our research question. It just complicates the design. Here the point is um if if we look at these designs here, uh uh, they, they are simple performance uh, uh, instruments and um, that's all we need to do, need to have for our research question. Let me talk about that now. So what are the predictions here? If we do money, you have to have a question? Yeah, uh, but isn't monitoring from the employer's perspective also important because if you cannot detect with the probability of one, that's whether effort level has yes. It is, uh, it is in reality in many cases, but for our research question, it's not necessary yeah, to complicate the story there because I want to have one example of simple incentives that people understand and see how that, that, does that example affect voluntary cooperation. The monitoring issue is an, is a, is an interesting one, but it's, 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 di it's a different dimension, I would argue. No, no, just bilateral. I mean, I would know what happened in my in our relationship. Yeah, yeah, but you, mm -hmm. yes. we're playing, you and I play one. I don't know if it's randomizing, whatever. But you yes, and I, play I haven't seen anything yet about that. Yes. Okay. But the, mm -hmm. the so this is talking about the stage game. Well, what's the implication yeah? in, in each of the subsequent stages? Um, the information is. I, I get to see if we are matched. I get about. I'm the. I, 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 I'm the employer. You are the worker. I, we, I get to see what the effort you chose, yeah. and that's it. But I don't know what the others did. Yeah. You know, there will be a new matching and the same thing. Okay. Yeah, in that sense, yeah. Okay. And the employer actually says what effort he wants to see. Yeah. Well, the employer. The employer asks for a particular effort. The employer says, "I pay you 200." I would like to have an effort level of 12 at least. And in case you don't come up with 12, I reduce your wage by 18. Very simple. Yeah? And the reason is, why did we do that? And here it come, becomes hopefully clear on this slide when I talk about the predictions. If you think about, if you are a maximizing worker here, what do you do? You compare the payoffs that you get from sticking to the contract to payoffs from shirking. So what are the payoffs from sticking to the contract? You know, I receive this fixed wage. I have to bear this effort costs of desired effort, so cost of 12, let's say. If the guy asks me for 12. Yeah. And, um, and if I shirk, you know, if I don't come up with this, I, I know that my wage is being reduced by this fixed amount. I have an incentive to choose the lowest effort level because um, this, 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 this wage will be reduced by a fixed amount irrespective of my ex uh, amount of shirking. And therefore, we have a very simple so-called no shirking condition. Don't shirk if the announced wage reduction exceeds what I lose, the wage uh, loss exceeds what I save, namely effort cost. Yeah, very simple. And that's the sole purpose here. Yeah, this is a very simple incentive scheme, not because it's realistic in the sense that uh, we normally, in reality, don't have that feature, okay? 
you, you shirk only a little bit and I reduce your wage by irrespective of how much you shirk is not realistic. Yeah? But it serves the purpose here uh, that it's very it leads to this very simple consideration. And that's the that's what is important for us at this stage. Yeah? So uh, put differently, the, the best reply effort, the optimal effort is to do what you are asked to do if the contract is not if the contract is incentive compatible, so this we call this incentive compatible or no shirking condition met or choose the minimum effort uh, whenever the content is not incentive compatible. That's what, that's what you do best. And that's, and if you think about this now, you see another rationale for this design, not only its simplicity, it also tells you in the trust game, there is no fine, no bonus. So therefore, uh, we have, a, we have a, 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 an nested case where the, 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 the best reply effort is always won. Yeah. And this is, how, this is how we achieved it in this experiment. Not for realism, again, but for our purpose of isolating these effects and comparing with it. This. Obviously, if you go through this reasoning for bonus, it's exactly the same, so absence of a framing effect is predicted here. And why did we choose these parameters here? So what we model here is what, what we call limited sanction or reward possibilities. You can only get so far with incentives. Yeah, this is the, the, the Bewley quote that I gave at the beginning. You always have, the, uh, voluntary cooperation is always going to be important. The way we model this is that with incentives you can only achieve some effort levels, but not, let's say, the, the last mile, so to speak. You, know, the, 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 the you, you can only get that with people's voluntary cooperation. You know, the real hard effort, preventing people from shirking and slacking off and so on, these sort of things, you can only get with voluntary cooperation. So this means in, in our experiment for design reasons, we, we decided to uh, limit the ma maximum incentive at 12 so that there is enough room for a voluntary cooperation uh, above 12, so out of these 20 levels that we have. Okay? And uh, obviously, this is now our working definition of voluntary cooperation. It's the difference between your actual effort and what is in your selfish best interest. Yeah. In the trust game, that's the difference between this is E star is one, in the other games it's E hat. Yeah. If you do more than what is required from you, or what, what, your, what, what your optimal interest is, your self-interest is, then we call this voluntary cooperation. And um, I already said this, I think, uh, efficiency enhancing efforts above 12 are only possible and feasible with voluntary cooperation. So, any questions so far? This is the stage game. These are the incentives in every single round. Yeah. Here is the design, how we study the questions we have. So, um, the, the the goal of the first set of experiments I'm talking about is to establish this reciprocity effect. Actually, I've already shown you the results. See the effects of paper performance that we actually get in this setup and establish the short and long run crowding out effects. So, in these experiments, people played for 20 periods in the first set of experiments. Then we, have we have another set of experiments I will talk later where people played for 30 periods. And we have three different treatments here. Um, it's TTT, people played 30 periods of the trust game. This is the for the seen the results. And then we have, these are the novel treatments here. The fine treatment, people start out with uh, 10 periods of the fine treatment. And then are told, okay, now we remove the possibility for fine. And they go and play 10 periods of the trust game. And in the bonus treatment, they start with 10 periods of the bonus. And then are told, okay, we remove the bonus. And, um, and they play only the trust game. So remember my definition of the short run crowding effect that says in the presence of incentives, how is voluntary cooperation affected? So we will observe voluntary cooperation here and compare it to the extent of voluntary cooperation that we get here. Yeah. If that's different, we have a crowding effect, a short run crowding effect. The long and crowding effect is comparing these effort levels. You know? yeah. uh, basically, this, this, this refers to what's the role of experience yeah, for your current effort choice. 
In this treatment here, you have experienced a trust environment. So what's the extent of trust that we, of voluntary cooperation that we get after having experienced trust? What's the extent of voluntary cooperation we get in a trust environment after having experienced fine? Or after having experienced bone, bo a bone treatment? Yeah, so this identifies the long-run crowding effect. It holds constant the, uh, the experience, you know, because it might be, and this is why this treatment is important, it might be that voluntary cooperation just goes down for some reason. Yeah? And uh, so we, we, we need this treatment to identify, to, to control for that possibility. So uh, what we did is we played these experiments in what's called random matching. So in every round, people were randomly matched into new pairs. And they played this game. They were told about the payoffs that resulted from their interactions. And then they moved on to the next round. Anonymity was preserved throughout and so on. Yeah. People were paid according to the decision and so on. So we ran these experiments at my previous university in Switzerland. We had 500 people. Uh, it was computerized. What is also important is that people answered control questions. So where we asked them, what do you earn as a function of different wage and effort combinations to make sure they understand their incentives here? Because there is no point of running an experiment like this without ensuring that people understand how they are getting paid for, yeah, and they earn decent money. So, any questions so far? Because before I go into the results. Yeah, another clarification question. So, uh, the players were matched randomly at each, uh, at each stage, right? And also... Uh, In this set of experiments, yes. And we talk about, if I have time later, we talk about experiments where they are matched into fixed pairs, but that's and later. And also the uh, amount of No, that's that's it is this up to the decision of the of the principal of the employer. If you are the employer, you decide in every round what do I pay now. Oh, so for each round, that that pair is fixed. Like we are, yes. Suppose we are matched in this round. You are the employer. I'm your worker. You make me a contract offer, which consists of the fixed wage, a desired effort, and a announced fine. I decide do I accept the contract. Or not, if I accept it, I choose an effort level. Payers are calculated according to the contract. Next period, you're matched with him. You, know, you decide for a new contract, you offer him, and so on. Okay? No, we didn't do that. You're all, you always kept your role. Okay, so he was doing employer. Yeah, yeah, he's an employer all the time, yes. Because that would have complicated matters again unnecessarily for our purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, in I, I, um, in these experiments, I think uh, we, we did it different ways. Not in this experiment. I think in this experiment we used uh, some sort of middle ground. But we used, I think, we used employment uh, terminology here. In other experiments, we used the uh, buyer-seller language to to communicate the roles, but it never made any big difference. So. So this sort of framing. Okay, any other question on the design? Well, how long would it take for a game to take place? Just a minute or something like that? Over all the experiments, or 30 periods, in most experiments uh, took 90 minutes. So, so this means the experiment itself, you know, the reading of the instructions takes maybe half an hour doing the control questions, and the experiment starts about an hour, an hour and a bit. And then they accept that they're not actually doing anything. No, that's true. Not in these experiments. No, 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 exactly. Not in these experiments, but I showed you some experiments. That uh, Because in these experiments, that's a good question. In these experiments, we want to be able to answer, we want to be able to come up with a prediction like this. Yeah. And for this, you know, I want to say, uh, I need to know the effort costs to be able to do that. So um, I, I, if, if, if I choose a real effort experiment where they do something, 
I can't come up with a prediction like that easily. I'm not saying that's not interesting, but it requires a different design. And I wanted, at this stage of the research, I wanted to be able to benchmark the sort of voluntary cooperation effects that I get in an environment that has, uh, that, you know, where we have observed voluntary cooperation consistently because we know exactly what a payoff maximizing individual will do. Yeah. So we benchmark this here. Again, not for realism, but I think the next step of this sort of research is could be to take this to a real effort environment. But that requires something different. We need to know, you know to be able, what is, in your what is crucial for our design is to know that, you know, to know exactly what is the, the incentive effect. You know, what is your best reply effort? So the environment would never know the history of your voluntary No. We would not. Not in these experiments. In some others, yes. Okay. Any question? Okay. I'll uh, show you the results. Uh, so let me talk about um, incentives effect and uh, some crowding effects on voluntary cooperation. So remember, this no shirking condition. Uh, the incentives say if the final the bonus exists because of desired effort, then you should come up with the desired effort. If this is violated, you should choose the minimum effort. Uh, in the trust treatment, you do that anyway because there is no final, no bonus. So here is uh, uh, the data from the from phase one of the fine treatment, and uh, here I show you the optimal effort the best reply effort, so this effort, as predicted by a given contract. And here I show you the actual effort, what people actually chose. Let's start down here, optimal effort, best reply effort of one, so this effort here. So we see that indeed there is a bunch of people, so this is a bubble plot, the, uh, that um, the, the dots are proportional to the number of underlying observations. You see there are quite a bit of observations at you know, at if the be optimal best reply effort is one, that is what people choose. Then we have all these observations here, where people chose something that's above one, i.e. above their best reply effort. So they deviated from their individual self-interest here, and this is voluntary cooperation. Okay? Even above 12, you observe a number of a uh, number of effort levels. So now we move away from one and given our setup here, this is uh, a best reply effort of more than one, it's only possible with an incentive compatible contract. Yeah. So and what you see here is, and the, the maximum incentive compatible contract was 12, and what you see here if the contract is incentive compatible, people do exactly what their best reply effort is. Yeah, they play, I mean, there are, there are very few deviations, you know, you can count them. Every single dot here is one case. Yeah. People are on the diagonal, you know, as predicted. If they deviate, which they sometimes do, you know, they deviate to the minimum effort. So people understand their incentive very well in this case. Yeah. These are cases of punishment where they have received an incentive compatible contract that uh, basically extracted paid them such a low wage that they wouldn't have earned anything. So they punish them by rejecting the contract, choosing minimum effort, but not by rejecting, but by choosing the minimum effort of one. Yeah, but by and large, people are, people are exactly incentive, behave exactly according to their best reply effort. Mm -hmm. and then, but if, if you took on any, on any of the other ones, it would be almost like a, a binary of you know, either zero or right on the line like that. Mm -hmm. It would be quite a dramatic way. I mean, the dots are good as well, but I don't think they're also good in that mm -hmm. distribution. Yeah, yeah, they are. And we'll see an example just in a, on the next slide then, or a couple of slides from now. So, this the, so the, the, op the conclusion here is voluntary cooperation exists, but only with non-incentive compatible contracts. So that's a form of crowding out that we see here. 
if the content is, is incentive compatible, there is no voluntary cooperation. But it's not because people are not willing in principle to go there. You know, for example, we have quite a few contracts here above 12, which is only possible with, uh, with, with voluntary cooperation. But if there is if there if content is incentive compatible, we just get that. Like in, it's like a textbook confirmation of that theoretical argument here. But it needs to be stronger in the sense that these dots don't refer to uh, the same person could, could appear somewhere in several places, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The same people who would Yeah, be sure. That is. Uh, um, good question. Um, here I don't distinguish between who you are. I just look at cases. I only distinguish between here, content incentive compatible or not. I look at different levels of what your optimal best reply effort is and see if the contract is incentive compatible, this is what people do. If the contract is not incentive compatible, you do observe some voluntary cooperation. Yeah. So I have not distinguished between people, but um, maybe I show you this first as well. So no difference in the bonus treatment, it's exactly the same. So, um, uh, and if you look at, in if you look at this treatment here, this the, uh, as you have seen in the first graph, you know, you see these people who, you see these observations where uh, people react to the wage and these people, are, I know, in cases where people don't react, it seems like that there are two distinct types of people, so people are more likely to be either in this camp or in this camp. But when it comes to incentives here, there's no difference whatsoever. So also the cooperator types who are willing to cooperate, yeah, if the content is incentive compatible, then they do exactly this. Yeah. This is true in fine and bonus. So we found that 67% of the contracts were actually incentive compatible, and 73% of agents yeah, actually did choose exactly the best reply effort. I thought that is a glorious victory for that model that predicts this is how people behave. Yeah. But it can't be the full story because, you know, if that were the sole story, then basically wh why do we observe these dots here? You know, we should observe no dots here. So something distinctly different is going on. The horizontal dots are restraining. The diagonal lines are restraining. The vertical line is clear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's look behind these dots. But no, let me say no to, to wrap up again. So this is a, a crowding out effect. If, there if contacts are incentive compatible, we get exactly that. Now let's look behind these dots. It's a different way of illustrating uh, and looking at this. So I benchmark this now with the trust treatment. So this you have seen this already. This is uh, wage, this is uh, effort, and you see have seen these, these uh, dots here. We see on average this uh, increasing a positive relationship. Now I look in data of the fine and bonus treatment if the contract is not incentive compatible. Remember the way we have this designed this experiment is the best reply effort is always the minimum effort if the contract is not incentive compatible. So we are exactly in the comparable situations in the trust game and in the incen non incentive compatible incentive games. And this is how the relationship looks like in the fine treatment. Yeah, basically, wage uh, effort, there is no relationship at all. Yeah, it has been shown to exist in so many experiments. But in this case, yeah, there, is in, in this, uh, there is voluntary cooperation. People, uh, there, these, all these thoughts are all over the place here. Yeah, but it's just unrelated. There are uh, some are at the minimum level here, but these thoughts are unrelated uh, to, to the wage. The same is true in bonus. So um, uh, there, there exists voluntary cooperation, but it's not reciprocity based any longer. It's not people don't react to high wage, high effort, low wage, low effort. It is just unrelated. They do something yeah, here. So um, <coughs> we can also look at this, uh, uh, how effort has developed over time. I only look at non-incentive compatible contracts. So this is 10 periods. This is the mean effort. This is how it looks like in the trust treatment, the benchmark. 
And this is how effort looks like in the non-incentive compatible contracts in the fine treatment. It looks a bit lower. And this is in the bonus treatment, looks a bit lower too. But if we compare this using the uh, regression analysis, we, we say, we, we speak of crowding out. If the average effort in the trust treatment compared to the average effort in non-incentive compatible fine tree contracts, holding the offer contract constant is positive. Yeah, so which means people co cooperate more in the, in the uh, trust treatment and in the fine tree, uh, final bonus treatment than uh, same in bonus, then uh, uh, we would speak of a crowding out effect. But if we control for all this, we find no significant difference. Yeah, so this means on average, one second, on average, yeah, we don't find a crowding out effect. So the average effort holding the exact same, con the exact the co holding the offer contracts constant, we don't find on average lower effort, despite the fact that um, the, 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 it's not reciprocity based any longer. Yeah? So um, it's, um, it's because people, people's effort is all over the place. And that on average has turned out to be such that efforts and wages are not related. I have not that yes, well I have not talked about that at all. Yeah, and um, uh, it's a good question whether it would be worth it or not. Here I'm interested in does this effect exist? Then the question is maybe if it exists, is it nevertheless worth taking that risk because I earn more if I? Well that's a different question. Yeah, um, we can answer that later. And I mean that's but not the focus here. Yeah, here the focus is do these crowding effects exist? How do they look like? Now we did expect a, a, a crowding out effect here. We didn't get it, although we got um, these effects. You know, and it explains basically why not. Because you know this means there are also high effort levels for for low wages. Yeah, this is true here, and that on average just induces people to come up with an effort level that uh, is such that the average effort level holding the contract constant is not lower than. So there is no crowding effect, but it's not reciprocity based. People do something. Yeah. So what about uh, uh, what I call the long run crowding out effect? So this is after the case where we abolished incentives. So we take the incentives away. Now we are all comparing contra uh, trust contracts only. So this is trust in phase two. So after having experienced trust, you've seen that already. This is trust in defined treatment you see that uh, uh, it looks a bit flatter than this one. And um, trust in the bonus treatment is very similar. It's lower. So here we do get the positive relationship between wage and effort, but it's just a bit flatter. And if you do the econometrics, this is again the time series. So this is phase one, trust and trust as a benchmark. This is phase one. This is just uh, what the, uh, on average which effort level we got in the bonus treatment. And this is average effort in the trust treatment after having experienced, uh, this is also trust, but after having experienced uh, a bonus treatment. And here the same uh, is fine. Again, you see no, diff no framing effect. So fine and bonus have the exact same behavioral consequences. And uh, if we compare now again the average trust, average effort of in trust after trust, so this with the average effort of trust after final bonus, so either these or the red line or the green line, holding the offer contract constant, we do get a significantly lower effort. So crowding out effect, the long run crowding out effect is present. It is indeed the case that holding everything else constant, having experienced an incentive contract makes you more selfish, this says. That understates the, the impact because we were sort of working with these average, average effort levels, and somehow it's we have this impression that what you want to get is the extra effort that the top end of the incentive contracts can't have. Mm -hmm. So if you were if you instead of looking at just the averages across here, if you're looking at well, what are the what are the chances of getting a, an effort level above fifteen or something like that? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a. Yeah. Uh, well, there it we can have the answer. So, f- fifteen zero. Yeah. Yeah. Fifteen. Well, ca- ca- almost zero. Two cases. And the trust we have uh, quite a few. Yeah, yes. Again, I, I like that approach of sort of slicing through the distribution that way. And how much extra effort could you get? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Mm-hmm. Good suggestion. Yeah. So. <coughs> okay. So um, why is that? Here's a tentative explanation: contracts and psychological signals. And uh, the trust contract. In our environment, you know, in this experimentally highly controlled environment, we have a wage, and it's very clear what this is a good wage or a bad wage, generous or mean. Yeah, so it sends an unambiguous signal of the employer's generosity. You don't need to interpret much. And then the psychology of voluntary cooperation kicks in, and on average, it turns out that um, most people, many people react reciprocally, and others selfishly. So it's a clear situation. Another clear situation is if the contract is incentive compatible. Yeah? Because it's a consistent appeal to the worker's self-interest. If you look at an incentive compatible contract, it's indeed the case I lose out if I don't come up with the desired effort level of 12. You know? I will learn less. Okay, it's really in my interest to do that, so people seem to understand that. Yeah? They are not uh, uh, irrational. So they respond in their uh, self-interest. If the contract is not incentive compatible, that's uh, our argument here, then this is uh, an inconsistent signal, or an ambiguous signal. The one that if I think through the incentive contract, I realize it's not in my interest to obey that contract. I'm better off shirking. Yeah? But on the other hand, they also see this wage. Yeah? And then um, so, which might appeal at, uh, towards their generosity. So, I have an inconsistent uh, signal towards your uh, self-interest and, and an appeal to your generosity, and on average, people do something, it seems like. So, <coughs> what we uh, invest, what if people, maybe this has something to do that people need to interpret uh, uh, these signals, and maybe experience helps. So, um, experience with a trust environment where I can basically separate out these wage effects. I, I understand this wage component effect. It doesn't interact with the presence of a, a consistent or I- inconsistent uh, uh, incentive contract. So, what we did is we ran a new experiment with different people where, we, where everybody started with 10 periods of the trust game. And then we did the exact same experiment as before. So now here the difference is that people have all have experience of trust. It's all random matching again. So <coughs> again, the incentive effects, we replicate the previous result on incentive effects. If the contract is incentive compatible, you know, uh, roaring victory for the best reply effort prediction. That's what they do. We have these deviations here. There is again voluntary cooperation. If the content is not incentive compatible. When you were uh, doing the control question, uh, was it th- they had to answer the control question yes. correctly before they could yes. proceed? Because sure. there was no chance of looking at correlation whether they uh, got the answers uh, incorrect. In yeah, if, they got an incor- if they gave us an incorrect answer, we pointed that out to them mm-hmm. and they had to think long and hard until they got it. Mm-hmm. And you know, it was never a problem. Is there any correlation? Do you have data on that, or do you have evidence on which uh, uh, subjects go uh, where, and could you look at <laughs> the ones that violated? <laughs> Probably we have, yeah. But um, I mean, I think it would be a very slim data set because eighty uh, percent of the p- of people had no problem to answer these questions correctly. So, yeah, another of these twenty percent who didn't get the right answer, if they pointed out this is not correct, they found the mistake themselves immediately. And there is a handful of people who need to be told more, so you know, but uh, they exist in all experiments, and I don't think I could make any st- story out of this here. 
Why do you think? You know, on average, the rationality, this tells you that people get this right. You know, I mean, obviously, we have chosen a transparent incentive scheme. Yeah. And this means, you know, if, the, if people, I mean, but that's the whole point of incentives anyway. You know, incentives can't have any behavioral effects if people don't understand them. Yeah. Then people do something. So if people understand the incentives, the question is, and this is a very transparent, simple incentive scheme, they still have the possibility of voluntary cooperation, but they don't do it. Yeah. There is no voluntary cooperation. In this case, it's even more dramatic. There is not a single observation above here. Yeah. There is one observation here. Yeah. One here, one here, so three cases. Yeah. And there is some punishment here where people choose the lowest effort because they have received mean wages. So people understand what they are doing. If, you know, because if you want to deviate, rationality says here, from the best reply effort, then you should go to the minimum effort level anyway. Because otherwise, you, know, you have to pay your fine anyway, and you just you earn less, and that's what people do. So people are rational. Yeah? And what we observe here is, so this means that we can't explain these points away as being irrational. Yeah? It has to do, with, I think, with uh, this is a different psychology. This is the psychology of voluntary cooperation. This is the psychology of incentives. And they doesn't fit into the, uh, uh, it doesn't fit together. Yes? I think the, the, the question there was the effect of experience on this. And these two graphs compared to the comparable two, the ones where they only had the you know, fine and bonus mm -hmm. two hundred fifty. He said there's, there's much less variance. Yes, yeah, sure. Whereas, whereas on yeah, the left-hand yeah. side, it looks heuristically about the same. Um, yeah, yeah it's, uh, I mean, but we are not talking about many cases there either. So um, if you go back to that case briefly, so uh, when these are, you can still count them. Yeah, it's yeah. a bit more experience than setting down, obviously, a bit more. Yeah, <laughs> but so these are, you can count these numbers here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, and about the same here, so cases out of, I don't know, many, many. And then once you get the experience though, sure, it goes uh, completely away, yes. So, <coughs> so what happens with reciprocity in the case of non-incentive compatible contracts after having experienced a trust environment? Back again, yeah, back into the game. Here we now see, you know, this is people have experienced the 10 periods of the trust game. We again, again get this Bivariate uh, bifurcation here, some people down here, some people here. But people having experienced this, the variance increases, but again, we have a positive relationship. Yeah. The same is the long run crowding out effect also has vanished. Yeah. The same is true in bonus treatment, we have a positive relationship between uh, uh, wage and effort after having experienced this. So remember this result, without being experienced, you know, people couldn't interpret this contract, so they chose something. If they have a, can, ex can, can interpret the, the contract, the generosity of the contract, then they focus on that even if the contract is not incentive compatible and they respond accordingly. Yeah, so reciprocity is back. We can basically, uh, we have turned it on and off. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how I'm doing time-wise? Ten, Ten more minutes, okay. Um, then I let me conclude with the, uh, very shortly, so we did these experiments here in a, in a, in a, in a, in a certain way, uh, lots of things that are not realistic here, yeah, but they uh, let us understand something about the psychology of voluntary cooperation. And for that reason we have, chain, we, we, we have random matching, not because of realism, but because to control for possible strategic incentives that people might have to cooperate which could, would have been a confound for the sort of effect uh, <coughs> we were interested in establishing. So now, that given that we have established some basic results, the question is, what, how do, does cooperation look like in repeated relationships which more resemble the uh, real life? Yeah. And what is also different in uh, uh, these things is that it allows for implicit incentives. Implicit incentives are you know, are not explicit, so they, they come from the fact that I have to share a common future with you, and therefore I don't want to 
uh, make you mad at me, you know, because I have to deal with you tomorrow as well. That is implicit incentives. And explicit incentives is if you do this, then this will happen. So we try to combine this. Exact same experiment, you know, <coughs> but now again with different people. Now in what we call this a partner treatment. So these, these people know that they are in these fixed uh, matches. So we can look at the effect of incentive setting, effect of effort levels and voluntary cooperation. So now this is just, uh, uh, you've seen this already, so split up into two panels, fine and bonus, since there is no difference, I pulled them. We found that 74% of contracts in the one-shot interactions yeah, that I we discussed at length before were incentive compatible and this is the result you have seen. So now we look and we compare this to a case of the, the repeated games yeah, where the implicit incentives exist. And this is how it looks like here. So this means that the largest number of observations is at the highest effort level. Yeah. So um, the, the you know, lots of non-incentive compatible contracts, only 26% of contracts are incentive compatible. But again, if they are incentive compatible, yeah, they do exactly, I mean, it's only a few cases, but if, you know, that's what people do. But here, the contracts, you know, were deliberately, in most cases, designed to be non-incentive compatible. Yeah, 74 percent of contracts were not incentive compatible. This typically means the employer asked for much more than the effort level of 12, which since the effort level of 12 was the highest effort level that could be achieved with an incentive contract, the contract was obviously non-incentive compatible. And nevertheless, you know, it seems to have worked quite well. But if the contract was nevertheless incentive compatible, so they asked for less than 12 and chose this, they got exactly this. Yeah, again, we have complete crowding out of voluntary cooperation in this case. Yeah, but, the but the implicit incentives, I, I like this a lot, you know. If the contract, if you have one-shot interactions, yeah, then, then it makes a lot of sense to rely on incentives here. Yeah. And we observed that three quarters of the contracts are actually incentive compatible. If you can also play on the implicit incentives, and they don't, it's, it's actually a bad idea to rely on incentive compatible contracts because you can get much higher effort otherwise. Yeah. There was a question, I think. So I, I, this is in relation to, to the wages, right? So um, with, with the repeat interactions, the wages allegedly were much higher? The wages, uh, yeah, they are, were they much higher? Uh, I don't know. This is this is not about the wages don't appear here at all. Exactly right. So I'm just assuming. Uh, so they're asking for uh, effort levels that are used well to establish a seamless relationship of payable time, uh, but in associated with that higher effort level request of twelve, calls for higher and higher wages in order to try and uh, establish this. You know. Uh, I don't remember. I don't. Um, they're not much higher. If they are higher at all. Okay. So it's about just because I'm not following this from like face face view, not not because I'm saying it's wrong, it's my face view. But if we take those two graphs, isn't one just a mirror image of the other? Is, are they quite independent samples that you have? Yes, they are. These are, are different. Quite independent they are samples? completely independent. <laughs> these are different people who participate in these experiments than in these experiments. So it's just oh, yeah, coincidental days. that they think they're different. Yeah, yeah, different days, uh, different people. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, that is uh, coincidental, yes. That is coincidental. Ah, yeah, good. That's coincidental. You see, you could, it's, it's on the right-hand graph, the big blob at the top is all the efficient contracts. It's just the efficient thing to do, it's the jointly efficient sure. thing to do with them is just to point them and, and, and somehow divide that money up. It doesn't even matter how it gets divided up. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that there's efficiency happening on the right-hand side. It isn't happening on the left-hand side. Yes, exactly. Yes. So I show you some uh, uh, diagrams of the. Um, I have two more slides, then I'm done. So, but uh, this is, I think, quite interesting how develop how effort has developed over time in these ex different experiments. So this is the trust treatment partners, the blue line, uh, the black line, and strangers. So this is average effort in this one shot. Yeah, every round, principal and agent are matched with somebody different. 
So you see you get these effort levels that uh, hovers around five or less. Yeah. Then we play this exact same experiment but in fixed pairs, in blocks of time period which they know. Yeah. So this is period one, so it builds up. It's dramatically higher than here. We, have, we get this crash here. Yeah, then they play again and they achieve the almost highest effort level, a crash again. But still, even in the last period, you know, this the effort level is clearly much higher. And then we have to build up to almost full efficiency yeah, here. And what you also see is they, m they make their, you know, they, they trust each other a little bit more every round and they make it to even the end game effect uh, increase, you know. Yeah, I like this a lot. I like this a lot. It's very interesting. I mean, it's very, you know, here they play on the power of implicit incentives. And obviously they earn much more. So these, these people here in the black line, they went home happy with lots of money. And these people here did relatively poorly in this environment. So what about in the fine treatment? It's also about the average effort. Again, we observe, so uh, let's, let's start here. So you see, this is just average is what happened, the average treatment effects. You, know, you, get, you see that, okay, introducing incentives actually does yield, you get you somewhere. And then we get this breakdown again. But um, the repeated game also has a very strong effect. So now we don't observe this build up here. You know, this increase in trust, they are basically fixed at this effort level slightly there. And uh, the same is true in bonus, with a little more variance. So, uh, <coughs> but it's clear from these pictures, I think, that the implicit incentives, uh, they are really strong. And, um, and um, we don't observe, obviously, here it doesn't matter because, you know, they, 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 they get an average effort level slightly above uh, 14 or around 14, which is above the incentive compatible left lane anyway, but they don't get beyond that also. Yeah. But here they are at 15 and here they are at uh, 18. So it is a bit of a difference. So it also has an effect on uh, reciprocity. So this is the estimated, there's now an estimated uh, relationship between uh, offer compensation and, uh, and effort. So this is the one-shot interaction. We see a positive relationship, higher rate, higher effort. So this is the estimated relationship in the repeated game. So the exact same contract, yeah, you observe more, a higher effort level in the repeated interaction than in the, in the one-shot interaction. So the implicit incentives here, they crowd in reciprocity, they strengthen reciprocity. You know, beyond the, what happened, beyond the non, this is non-strategic reciprocity if you want. And this differential here is uh, strategic reciprocity. That comes from the fact of being in a fixed relationship. Okay, let me wrap up briefly. So what we wanted to do here is to provide a comprehensive analysis of uh, voluntary, uh, voluntary cooperation and performance incentives in a gift exchange setting, which has been studied a lot. And we chose this particular setting because it provides a very well established benchmark and we can see what happens if we introduce incentives here. And we wanted to answer several questions here. What we got is that there are very strong incentive effects if the contracts are incentive compatible. Yeah, this holds in all treatments. Incentive compatible contracts lead to exactly the predictive behavior in the majority of cases. This is true in, 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 all, in all three experiment, experiments I presented you here. Yeah. We don't find shorter and crowding out effect if the contract is not incentive compatible although there is no reciprocity, yeah. so it just bro broke down. We have evidence for long-run crowding effects, but experience, yeah. so these effects are not confounded with any experience with trust, but if we have experience, then these effects are also uh, coming back, so yeah, non-incentive compatible contracts brings back reciprocity, yeah, but still, you know, experience doesn't help you to overcome the lack of voluntary cooperation in incentive compatible contracts. Doesn't bring it back. Implicit incentives are very strong. So in terms of the effect sizes, if you want, what's first order importance and second order importance, I would under that reciprocity, explicit and implicit incentives are clearly first order effects. These are the big effects that we have here. So uh, 
And in general, the general message is that contracts do send psychological signals. So it depends on the whole package of what people interpret these contracts. Yeah, whether they have experience, the experience and everything will determine how they behave under a given contract. In particular, if this contract is not incentive compatible. If it's incentive compatible, they do, at least in this environment, consistently across three studies. They do exactly what the contract tells them to do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. somehow combine the benefits of performance incentives and reduce kind of the signal of this bad Yeah, I think what would happen is typically, um, and ex I think we did some experiments, uh, but we have not really properly looked at them. Um, what happens is um, they go towards incentives and uh, they probably would go to a, fine a bonus contract uh, a bit more but they always, they would definitely use uh, the incentives. So what we did, we implicitly we did, uh, we did give them some sort of choice because if you remember, the final bonus included zero. So I could decide, ex yeah, uh, explicitly decide, I don't reduce your wage. I could send this signal. You know, I don't go to reduce your wage even if you come up with an effort level of, uh, uh, of less than my desired effort level, but was basically never chosen. They always went for the maximum f maximum incentive in the much majority of cases. Yeah. There is a bit of an attribution bias in the literature, so people tend to think that others are more selfish or less intrinsically motivated than them. So you know, I might think, I surely I am a voluntary cooperator, but you probably not. So I use incentives for you. you know, I surely think you are in. You know, you are, you are, I am intrinsically motivated. I do these things because I like them, but people around me don't. So, I, so this attribution bias has been established uh, by in a very nice uh, paper by G. P. Uh, in uh, Organizational Behavior and Human Decision Processes. Um, that this attribution error occurs many times, I think. Well, it's, an it's an interesting question, and this has... Um, not been started yet, I think, in this sort of framework. But uh, here, I know here is really the, this is just you can think of this as sort of a first step of making making this a bit more realistic in the sense that in reality we do have explicit incentives many times I and mean implicit incentives, and how do they affect voluntary cooperation? Yeah, that is what we have. This is where we are now. Now we can ask several questions. For example what would be an optimal contract here. Based on this result, the optimal contract would probably be to offer an incentive compatible contract, but don't make a mistake. Yes. 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 I'm. I'm not claiming that incentive contract can't be. No, no. Uh, not if exactly. You don't get it right, it's not work. Yeah. Sure. No. 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 Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I did. I. I mean, I'm pretty sure, given these results, you know, from three treatments, if contracts are incentive compatible, you get there. I have no reason to believe that they will not extend this up to twenty. Yeah. But uh, remember that uh, you know I was interested in do you get above. You know, I if there is room for voluntary cooperation, do people get into that room, into that space? They don't. They can only get there by implicit, in implicit incentives. They do get there. Yeah. And sometimes with generous contracts and one-shot games as well. Yeah. 
So that's what you need. But explicitly, I mean, this is, but again, this is a deliberate modeling choice here to say we wanted to, we wanted to put a cap on incentives at 12 to, to pick up that idea that in reality there's always room for voluntary cooperation in many real world situations. Yeah. I think that's the rationale. <coughs> No, no. Thank you.